Content warning. This episode contains discussion of the murder of two girls. So far, we've discussed the publicly released facts of the Delphi murders with an array of experts, both on and off the record. We've run episodes that feature interviews with firearms and forensics experts, investigators, and defense attorneys. We've talked to Brett and Alice from the Prosecutors Podcast, and Tony and Brandon from the Catfish Cops Podcast, and more. In this episode, we're very excited to add yet another perspective to that list. We're talking to a career prosecutor who has 25 years of experience trying criminal cases. We transcribed our interview with her, and Anya will read out her quotes. We're doing that to protect her identity, since she's still in the field of criminal justice. Rest assured, we have verified her identity and professional accomplishments. We lightly edited the conversation to take out off-the-record portions and for clarity. As we've said before, we wish to continuously draw on the expertise of a wide variety of different people, including attorneys, firearms experts, and individuals with law enforcement expertise. Some of these sources may prefer to remain anonymous. In those cases, rest assured that we are verifying their identity and level of expertise before airing their comments. In some instances, the experts may disagree, signifying a more contested subject. In other areas, we may get a bit of a consensus going. We view all of this as an ever-evolving conversation. Either way, we want everyone who cares deeply about the Delphi case to get the benefit of these insights. We want you to be more informed about the issues, as many of them may not be apparent to anyone outside these fields. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. We first connected while looking into the Burger Chef murders, an Indiana cold case. Together, we built a spreadsheet documenting hundreds of cases of restaurant-related homicides. That original spreadsheet gave way to our podcast, The Murder Sheet. Now we maintain that same research-centric, investigative approach as we look into all sorts of homicides, including unsolved cases, historical crimes, and, of course, restaurant murders. We don't just chat about the headlines. Our podcast is a platform for our journalism. The Murder Sheet focuses on investigative reporting, thoughtful analysis, thorough research, and in-depth interviews. We're the Murder Sheet. And this is The Delphi Murders, a prosecutor's perspective. What sort of thoughts did you have reading the probable cause affidavit in this case? Well, the first issue I have is probably the same one that many of your guests have had, and that is that it appears to be the bare minimum. You read it and you realize they must have other evidence that they're just not putting in there. As a prosecutor, I wondered why. I understand keeping some of it out, but a lot of the evidence is going to come out in pretrial motions. So if you're worried about tainting a jury pool, that doesn't really seem to be a very good explanation. And I, as a prosecutor, would want the people in my county to feel comfortable that we had sufficient evidence and that this is the guy that did it. Now, when I read the affidavit, I clearly believe that Richard Allen is the guy. But as you look at it further, there are holes. You would think that there's other pieces of evidence. And you hope that there may be other pieces of evidence. And one of the things that stood out to me was the fact that we don't have the entire affidavit. The entire affidavit alludes to Richard Allen kidnapping the girls. At no point is there any evidence to indicate that he killed them, so that final page that we're missing must somehow tie him into the killing. I understand that he's charged with felony murder, not murder, but even in the criminal complaint, they specifically state that he did kill them in the course of kidnapping them. So that's what we're missing from the affidavit. How did he kill them, 
And was he the one that killed them? And how do they tie him into the killing? Now we can jump to conclusions, but it just seems to be missing from what we have thus far. We noted that we heard the missing page 8 was just the judge's signature. And we wanted to know if the prosecutor thought that sounded correct. Bear in mind, she's from a state that is not Indiana. It's possible her jurisdiction does things differently. But she raised some strong points about what you'd potentially expect to see in a PCA. I'm looking at what I have. The last paragraph just says, basically, I, the affiant, along with investigators, believe the statement made corroborates it's Richard Allen. In every affidavit of probable cause, there's a conclusionary paragraph that will say, based on the aforementioned, this affiant represents that there is sufficient probable cause to believe that Richard Allen did cause the death of Libby and Abby in violation of whatever the proper statute is. Like, there's always that conclusionary paragraph. That's how we do it in my jurisdiction. I don't see that here, and I don't see that he caused their death. I see that he kidnapped them, he told them to go down the hill, and then they were found dead. And the bullet or cartridge that was found corresponds to his firearm and was found near them. But the affiant of the PCA is supposed to write a conclusionary paragraph where they tie everything together and say how that is a violation of the specific statute. And I don't see that here. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I do not want to jump all over the prosecutor. I know nothing about him or the details of the case. And clearly I know nothing specific about this fact pattern except what I've heard and read. So they may have included more that we are just not privy to. We're definitely always open to that. One thing that we've tried to keep in mind in our coverage is that we're only seeing the outside of the case. So much goes on behind the scenes that we don't hear about, or that we don't hear about until months later. Yeah, but I'm surprised that more people aren't really talking about the fact that the full affidavit of probable cause wasn't released. And if it's just a signature page missing, then I, as a prosecutor, probably would have included more information, as I said, tying Richard Allen to the actual killing, especially since that's what they say in their criminal complaint that he did. Would there be any strategic reason for a prosecutor to really go bare bones with a PCA at this stage? Well, I know the prosecutor and law enforcement have alluded to the fact that there may be someone else involved. If they think there is a co-defendant who actually participated in the crimes with Richard Allen, they may want to still withhold certain evidence in case that individual comes forward or in case they may have to interview that person. But as I just mentioned, the pretrial publicity aspect of it doesn't really seem to merit keeping it out of the affidavit of probable cause. So I really don't know why. In your experience, have you ever seen a PCA this thin? I mean, there's probable cause. A hundred percent, I feel there's probable cause to arrest and charge Richard Allen. I would have put more in if I had more. We'd like to ask you a few questions breaking down the different aspects of the PCA that sort of stood out to us. There's the bullet, which I think for a lot of people is the biggest concrete evidence possibly tying Allen into this. We've mentioned in our talks with defense attorneys on the show that this likely would be a battle of the experts at trial. What's your experience with those kinds of cases? And can you tell us about the back and forth between defense and prosecution when it comes to that ballistics and tool mark? identification evidence? Yes, I've used ballistic experts and firearm experts. If that's the ultimate issue in the case, was that particular firearm used, then it's definitely going to be challenged. The defense attorney will hire an expert. The state may even hire a second expert, and there will be visual aids. And I think some of your other guests have referenced this. It's just going to be who becomes more credible. That is really what it's going to come down to. Which of the experts is the jury going to believe? And the pictures are going to tell a big part of the story. Every single part of this case is going to be litigated before it ever goes to the jury. Every single issue you can think of. The first issue is always admissibility. Everything from, and I'm going to point something else out, and I don't think it's going to be a big deal. But the initial search and finding of that cartridge on the property, if that was private property and they did not have a warrant, even finding the girls there, defense attorneys will challenge that search. They won't be successful, but they're going to challenge it. So, for example, if you're looking for a couple of girls, you believe they may be injured or dead, you can really go into private property. It's sort of an emergency aid exception to the search warrant requirement. 
But once you find them, technically, you should secure that scene if it's on private property and get a search warrant to search for all the other evidence. Now, they can argue an exception to the search warrant for continuing their search, which they probably will. But that issue is going to be litigated. Whether or not the ballistics expert is qualified in rendering his opinion, whether or not it's a legitimate field, whether or not there's an actual comparison, that's just all on the bullet alone. Every other thing is also going to be litigated before it goes to trial. I thought your recent experts did a good job supporting the area of ballistics, and I've always found it to be a believable and scientific process, the comparison of tool markings, ballistics. I've never ever had a case from the injector, though. And I'll be interested to see how that plays out. I don't think it will be precluded, but when an expert is qualified in a particular field, you can't just come in and say, I'm an expert. You have to be qualified for purposes of court. There will be a whole day probably of voir dire about how much an expert this person is. Then that area of expertise, the prosecutor is going to want to make him the most specific expert ever. So will this expert be an expert in ejection markings? Or will he just be an expert in tool markings? Will he be an expert in this particular gun? Or will he just be an expert in firearms in general? And the defense is going to try to make it very, very broad. And the prosecutor is going to try to make it very, very concise to make him seem like a super duper expert. I think it's going to be left pretty broad, and it's just going to be up to whoever the jury believes. Most members of the public have an idea of how criminal cases work from watching fictional shows and watching condensed versions of investigations and trials on different true crime programs. But what you mentioned about a lot of this being decided before the jury even gets in the room is very important. Could you expand upon that and how important the pretrial hearings will be? As someone who's worked these cases for the prosecution, what are your thoughts and experiences with that aspect of it? In this particular case, I think it's going to come down 100% to the judicial ruling. I think it's going to be a matter of, as I just mentioned, the ballistics, if there's blood splatter, if there's DNA, the statements that are alleged to have been made by Richard Allen, any statements by witnesses, any videotape, all of those things are going to be challenged. The admissibility of those is going to be determined by the judge. And for legal reasons, she may exclude one or more of them. And then when they go to trial before a jury, it's still going to be argued again before the jury that they were seized unlawfully. And then it's also going to be argued that the jury shouldn't believe whoever it is saying something happened or that they saw something. So it's sort of a three-step process. Admissibility in the trial. And then when you get in the court, the defense will argue it's junk science or it was seized unlawfully. They will also argue, just don't believe whoever's talking on behalf of the state. There are things in the PCA that are very questionable, like the defendant's statements. They don't even really clarify where and how those statements were acquired. I know the first one, the tip, is the one that's spoken about the most. And it is perplexing to me. How was that information acquired back in 2017? I know the defense released a statement where they said Mr. Allen contacted law enforcement and then met with a conservation officer, which seemed odd to me. And was that memorialized? Did he record that? Did he write it down? Did he file a report right away? If five years later he remembered that tip and he had never written it down, his credibility is going to come into question. And the defense attorney can always argue, my client never made that statement. That never happened. Or he can say, my client said one or two things. He didn't say everything. Similarly, with the second statement, which was presumably at the execution of the search warrant, that to me is the most amazing one, right? October 13th is when they searched Richard Allen's home. That's right. Yes, See, that to me seems odd. I listened to or read something where HLN's Barbara McDonald interviewed a couple of Allen's neighbors, and the neighbors described the situation, and tell me if you think I'm remembering this wrong. Law enforcement came in that day and secured the Allen residence, but they didn't search. Hours later, someone else showed up with the paperwork, and then a search took place. That to me means that the probable cause for that search occurred simultaneously, because we don't do search warrants that way. If I'm going to do a search warrant on a house for guns or drugs or child sexual abuse material, we get that search warrant at least a day ahead. We prepare what's called an operations plan, an ops plan, where you have to detail who all is involved, where the hospital is, where the police department is, what you're going to do, who's going to do what. 
and then you go in at the crack of dawn, sort of for a surprise element, and you execute the search warrant as you serve it on them. And simultaneously, you'll attempt to speak with the suspect. And at that time, law enforcement would usually try and take the suspect back to headquarters and to interview him at that time. It doesn't sound like that's what they did. The fact that they secured the residence and then showed up later with paperwork makes me think that something happened on that day to give them enough probable cause to search that house. Again, I wonder if there was a very, very thorough interview with him by police at the police department, or if he declined, or if they didn't ask and they just interviewed him in the police car. And even under those circumstances, we have a rule. It's called C plus I equals M. Custody plus interrogation equals Miranda. So they're under an obligation at that point to advise him of his rights to an attorney and to remain silent. Hopefully they advised him of that. Hopefully they recorded any interview that they conducted on October 13th. Because without a recording, immediately the defense is going to challenge what was said. They may deny all of it. They may deny some of it. That's the main question I had about that one. Was it performed constitutionally, the interview? Where was it done? Did he ever invoke a right to an attorney? And then going forward to Alan's third statement, you have to read the affidavit clearly to realize there were three. There was the one to the conservation officer. There was the one at the search warrant. And then apparently on the 26th, they interviewed him at an ISP post. And this was prior to his arrest. I'm very curious about under what circumstances that occurred and what information he provided. We talked a bit about the initial search warrant served on Allen's house. The prosecutor noted that search warrants are usually presumed valid, and she was curious about whether a magistrate or a county judge signed off on the initial search warrant. We actually don't know the answer to this, but she noted that there was a strong presumption of validity when it comes to these search warrants. It would really have to be bad to suppress evidence from the execution of the search warrant. The only thing would be, I can't even come up with an idea. Unless everybody lied and everybody knew everything in the affidavit was just a lie, which I highly doubt. Yeah. Unless they just really wrote it so poorly that there's no indication that there would be evidence of a crime there. But based on the information that they provided in this PCA, it seems that they did have I'm assuming that they ran a firearms check prior to the search warrant and determined that he owned a firearm that was capable of discharging the cartridge that was found there. So that in and of itself is kind of going to be sufficient. The other issue is what they call the staleness. If your probable cause evidence is what we call stale or old, then the judge should not approve of the search warrant. If I'm an undercover officer and I buy drugs from my neighbors or someone in my jurisdiction's house in 2017, I can't then get a search warrant in 2020 and say, I have probable cause to believe there's drugs here. That's a three-year difference. But on the other hand, a firearm that's lawfully registered to someone when there's no indication that they've disposed of it, if they presented a firearms check to show that he'd bought it and it was still in his name and had not been transferred to anyone else, that's a good basis to start to get your search warrant. I would hope that they would have a little bit more than that. But if that's all they had, that's all they had. You couldn't imagine that five years later they'd still have bloody clothing. You could imagine that he might have a souvenir that was mentioned in the other search warrant affidavit. So you kind of argued souvenir plus he has this firearm registered to him and it hasn't been transferred to anyone else. That could be sufficient probable cause to search. And presumably, they also were looking for, on the computer, maybe searches for the trail or maybe any communications between him and the girls or him and Mr. Klein or anyone. They would probably include all of that in their affidavit for the search warrant. Many, many times, if someone retains the firearm that they've used, they also keep the bullets. So it's very likely that they found the box of bullets that will in turn match the one that was found at the scene. I've had that happen numerous times. Because ammunition is expensive, and if this person's thinking, I can retain this firearm without being caught, he's certainly going to think, I can certainly retain this ammunition without being caught. That's going to be a big, big thing. It would be the first thing I would look for when I went there, as well as for clothing for DNA. We always love to cover a good historical mystery on the murder sheet, so it's not a huge shock that our favorite game is all about a 1920s detective 
hot on the trail of all sorts of strange happenings. We're talking about June's Journey. It's a free-to-download hidden object game, and it's utterly delightful. You play as June Parker, a sleuth from the 1920s. In each level, you inspect scenes for hidden clues. I play so much that I'm already on chapter 12. To advance levels, you get to decorate your own personal island estate. I love collecting different features, like a beautiful swan pond, a swirling windmill, and a gaggle of old-time reporters. I'm very proud of all of those. Whenever I'm solving mysteries, I get to travel everywhere from Cuba to Paris to Italy to investigate cases involving artistic scandals, blackmail, and murder most foul. One thing that makes June's journey special for me is the lovely artwork underpinning each level. The attention to detail really makes each scene come alive, and the characters are packed with personality. It's really immersive and makes us feel like we've been dropped into an old-fashioned mystery story. I can get a bit antsy whenever I'm stuck waiting in line or on hold during a call. June's Journey is a great respite, a chance to play a fun game and get a mental boost while I'm at it. Find your first clue by downloading June's Journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. One reason the Delphi murders have resulted in such a complex investigation is that multiple agencies are involved. On the federal side, the FBI came into the case very early on, although they've seemed to have limited involvement since. The U.S. Marshals are still seemingly actively working the case. On the state level, the Indiana State Police are very involved. The Carroll County Sheriff's Office is still in the mix. The Delphi Police were also involved early on in a more limited capacity as we understand it. The prosecutor we talked to has also worked cases involving multiple agencies. We asked her about that experience. You mentioned that the prosecutor's office often runs point in your jurisdiction when multiple agencies are involved. What sort of learnings have you had over the years from working cases with multiple agencies? How do you keep agency conflicts in check? That's a good question. Everybody's allowed to share their opinions. There's a point person for each agency also. Not everyone is just allowed to yell, hey, I think so-and-so did it. And you just make sure every morning there's a muster, and every morning there's a sharing of information, and then there's a distribution of assignment sheets as to who's going to do what and who's going to talk to whom. And then that information, that person will write a report eventually, maybe not the same day. That's going to be provided to probably a sergeant or lieutenant who's really in charge of the whole thing. And then the prosecutor, I myself would be involved in the legal decisions as well as I'm kind of more hands-on. So I like to know everything. In recent times, I have not had cases where there have been any conflicts. Everybody works well together and different viewpoints are just shared and respected. Everybody has different assignments and jobs. We also talked about the strange fact that the tip on Allen was seemingly lost in the shuffle until 2022. Keep in mind that your IMEI, or International Mobile Equipment Identity, is a 15-digit number that is totally unique to each device and also serves as your phone's fingerprint, essentially. Richard Allen's IMEI was mentioned in the PCA in the initial tip from the conservation officer who interviewed him back in 2017. I noticed in the affidavit of probable cause where they were talking about Richard Allen's phone and the information about his cell phone, how did the officer get that? How did he get the IMEI? You actually have to open the phone up and get that. And he was concerned enough to have done that? I have the same question everyone else does. Why wasn't he screaming and yelling all the way to the state capitol saying, hey, everybody, you have to look at Richard Allen? In my jurisdiction, there's a requirement regarding filling out paperwork. It's called an assignment sheet so that everything is retained and is reviewable. I don't know how in 2017, which really wasn't very long ago, That particular tip was lost. That's the question I want to know the answer to, just personally. Is it possible that the IMEI thing was just a pro forma question? They were telling all law enforcement personnel to ask everyone for their cell phones and IMEIs? It could be. I've never utilized this information before. Usually a cell phone number in and of itself is sufficient. So I don't know. I don't know why he got that IMEI information. There might be some other reason that I'm just not familiar with. And I don't know why it was a conservation officer who was involved in this. Unless, I was surmising that maybe Richard Allen knew him 
and that is how they agreed to meet, which is also why the defense attorney outwardly in his press statement admitted that Richard Allen had this conversation, because it would be very hard for him to refute that if he socially knew the conservation officer. But to me, meeting at a supermarket to talk is so casual. It's very, very casual. We noticed that too. That being said, the prosecutor told us she believes there's still enough in the PCA for the prosecution to mount a good showing at trial. As it stands, is there sufficient evidence to convict him beyond a reasonable doubt? If you went with just what was in here, probably because two girls are dead, I could see a jury doing it, especially an Indiana jury. And as long as the ballistic expert was qualified and was more credible than the defense expert, but we don't even know what legal arguments are going to come up. A very, very thorough defense attorney may go all the way back to the first tip. And if, in fact, this particular officer, who the defense attorney says is a conservation officer, if he prepared a report, it would have had to have been entered electronically. Things aren't done on paper anymore. So if they want to challenge the timing of the entry of that, if they want to argue this particular officer isn't remembering correctly because he never wrote a report, and it's been known that police officers will try and backdate things. I could see him stalling this trial by requesting a forensic examination of the police department computers. I've had that happen. Just to make sure that, in fact, that the report was written on the day that the officer says it was written on. If they're extremely thorough, they will challenge anything and everything. It may not behoove them to do that. They may find that a more simplistic, just straight-out denial is the best thing to do. But if they want to attack the credibility of that witness, they could ask them, why didn't he record it? When did he write it? When did he put it in the computer? Who did he send it to? Who was it reviewed by? Why didn't he talk to anybody? That's why I was surprised when the defense attorney actually admitted in a press release that the statement was made. That seemed odd, like he was showing his hand. He can still deny that Richard Allen ever made the statement, but it seemed to me that he was sort of cutting off that avenue. And I firmly believe that unless they were recorded, they will deny the statements Richard Allen is alleged to have made. I'm sure they'll deny those statements. Because if he puts himself there, and he puts himself in those clothes, and he puts himself, say, walking bloody and muddy, and it's his gun, it'd be really hard for him to say he didn't do it. So they're kind of backed into a corner where they have to deny some of those statements and they have to deny that that was his firearm used. The bloody and muddy thing brings up the use of eyewitnesses in the probable cause affidavit. What did you make of their testimony as referred to in the affidavit? It seemed pretty straightforward. The authors of the affidavit didn't try to change the witnesses' statements. It doesn't seem. Because they're kind of inconsistent. And that's what we expect when we have eyewitnesses. Not everybody sees things the same way or focuses on the same objects or the same colors or the clothing or the demeanor. Someone might notice something that another individual may not. I'm just glad these witnesses came forward. The bloody muddy one is very, very important. And I know you had a guest earlier that would have suggested possibly a photo array. I'm not a big fan of those, unless they're immediately following the event, and even then they're questionable. I definitely would never give a photo array to somebody five years later, under no circumstances. There's just too much room for them picking out the wrong person, and the likelihood of them picking out anybody is slim to none. And I don't think anyone would expect law enforcement to do a photo array to the witnesses so far after the crime. Carroll County Prosecutor Nick McClelland and Indiana State Police Superintendent Doug Carter have publicly alluded to the possibility that some other people could be involved in this crime in some capacity. The felony murder charges against Allen also open the door to that. From your perspective as a prosecutor, if they don't either clear that up or introduce more charges against other people, how could that play out in Richard Allen's trial? Could that be a hindrance to the prosecution, or does that not even really matter? I would never indict someone for felony murder without the actual murder, if it was only a sole person. I would do, this person caused the death of so-and-so purposely and knowingly, and then do the felony murder. If there's two people, they might leave it at just the felony murder for Richard Allen. And there's also other language you could use, like accomplice liability. There's different ways you could do it. But I would expect more charges to come, obviously, because they clearly didn't charge him with whatever weapon was used. It sounds like it wasn't a firearm. 
So they would want to charge him with possession of a weapon for unlawful purpose and unlawful possession of a weapon, and then separately charge him for the kidnapping. I'm not quite sure why they didn't just put that in the affidavit of probable cause to arrest him. It's going to come out eventually anyway. Why didn't they just say how the girls were killed and what weapon was used? It must be because they think someone else participated, and they're still waiting for that person to give the facts that are unknown to the public. That's the only thing I can think of. Either that or incompetence. Those are the two options. I think this might be the $64,000 question. We all know that not every bit of evidence has to be in the PCA, and they may have more evidence that we don't even know about. But let's assume hypothetically that all of the evidence they have is in fact in the probable cause affidavit. If that was the case, would you as a prosecutor have moved forward with an arrest? Yes, I would have. I think there's definitely probable cause to believe he committed the crime based on the evidence that's in the PCA. As a prosecutor, I have an ethical obligation that if I'm going to move forward, I have to believe that I can prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. So there's two different standards. I definitely believe that I could prosecute based on the information they provided and prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. I would like more. A hundred percent, I would. I would like more. But with his statements putting himself there, three separate statements to three separate officers stating he was there that he was in sole possession of the firearm and does not know Ron Logan, does not know the girls. He was on the trail, the ballistics that say his firearm ejected the cartridge that was found by the girls and the eyewitnesses in the sketch. I would definitely prosecute this case. We also wanted to ask you something about a related case, which is, of course, the child sexual abuse material charges against Kagan Klein. Our big question about that is, why did it take so long for him to get arrested? The materials were discovered in February 2017, and he was arrested in August 2020. What could delay justice for that long? I'm not as familiar with all the facts, so I'll assume that what you just told me is right and that law enforcement was aware that he possessed those and had proof that he possessed them and that they had that proof in 2017. Why they would wait is they were clearly developing a stronger or different case against Mr. Klein, in my opinion. There would be no reason not to arrest him. I believe having listened to one of your previous podcasts, they executed the search warrant early on in 2017 against Mr. Klein, right? Yeah, on the 25th of February 2017. The girls were killed on the 13th. Yeah. They could have done a forensic analysis of his electronics within a couple of weeks and had the information. So my only assumption is that he was a cooperating witness or they felt that him being on the street, as we say, would be more beneficial to them and in developing a stronger case against him or a case against more people. Or maybe there are people involved in the child sexual abuse material ring and they needed him out there. Or maybe he was involved in something else, such as the Delphi murders. The prosecutor also advised us and everyone observing this case closely to prepare for a long wait for answers. There are going to be so many motions in this case. There's just going to be so much to argue legally, even though it doesn't seem like it. They already filed a motion to move the trial because of prejudice, right? Yes. I had one of those ones, too. There's going to be so much to argue. This case can't possibly go to trial for two years. There's no way. What's your opinion on moving a trial? Is that something the judges typically go for? I imagine the prosecutor won't like that because it happened in his community. He's going to want to keep it in Carroll County, I would imagine. Yeah, I think he would want to keep it in Carroll County. Nowadays, though, the lines are sort of blurry because of social media. It doesn't really matter if you're in a different county. It used to be in the old days, you'd just read about a crime in the newspaper, your local newspaper. And if you lived a county or so away, you might never hear about that crime. But now everybody knows about it. So I don't know. I don't think they'll grant the motion pre-jury selection. That's called presumed prejudice. I think they'll actually wait until they start to pick a jury, and if it just becomes impossible, then they might move it. Unless, of course, the prosecutor agrees. And he might agree. If you go to an adjacent county that's the same demographics, he may not have a problem with that. It might be the best thing for the case. The last thing in the world you want to do as a prosecutor is try a case knowing that there are legal issues that could come back and bite you. 
you don't want to get a guilty verdict and then have it be reversed. So I always try to do things above board, make sure it was as clean as possible. So if I do get the guilty, that guilty sticks. Hopefully they'll do the same thing. I imagine a successful appeal and an overturned conviction would be agonizing for everybody, especially in a murder case. Oh, that's just the worst part of it. If the prosecutor takes a plea, we call that the finality of the case. Just to understand that it's over. Because although people can appeal once they've pled guilty, it's very unlikely that it will be overturned. So guilty pleas are actually a very good thing, which is why most cases are pled out. And if they plead them out to, say, life imprisonment, that would be a very good outcome, especially if he gave up anybody else involved. One of your guests raised the issue of the fact that there have been so many suspects over the years. That's going to play out in court, too. And the finality of the case would be, that's the ultimate goal, just to get it done and get justice for the girls. How bad is it for the prosecution that there were other suspects? We've also heard it argued that maybe it's good that they didn't get blinders on. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree both ways. A standard defense argument is, you had my guy on this the whole time, and you didn't look at anybody else, and my guy was railroaded. Obviously, they cannot make that argument here, so that's very good. But defense attorneys, for the most part, try to just do the spaghetti on the wall defense. In this case, this defense attorney is saying, my guy didn't do it, but in addition, here's all this other stuff of why the case is so terrible. They're going to throw everything up on the wall, and they're going to start to say, point fingers at every other human being that was looked at, and probably every other human being that lives in Delphi. It'll be up to the judge to corral all of that, because you can only go so much into blaming other people. But the defense attorney will be able to say, what about Kagan Klein? What about Ron Logan? What about all these other people? When it comes to a jury, the prosecution needs 12. The defense attorney only needs one. They just need one person to say, I don't think he did it. I think somebody else did it. Or, I don't think the state proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt. They're only looking for one. We're looking for 12. Is there anything we didn't ask you about? Or any misinformation on how criminal trials and prosecutions work that you think it's important to clear up for the listeners? No, I think you guys have done a terrific job of keeping everything straight. I don't even think that there's been anything particularly bad said about any of these prosecutors. No one's alleging planting of evidence or lying. It's just a very, very long, complicated process. And we have to have faith in the system and faith in the prosecutor's office. And as I said, he has enough evidence, not just for probable cause, but beyond a reasonable doubt. Give him an opportunity to present it and the jury to make the right decision and find Richard Allen guilty. Thanks again to this prosecutor for sharing your expertise and time with us. We very much appreciated it. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murdersheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening. Hey everybody, just popping back in to talk about June's journey again. This is the amazing free-to-download mystery hidden object game. It's delightful. Anya is always playing this game. She's obsessed with it. I love to pretend to be a 1920s detective going around the world trying to solve different cases. It like puts me in that headspace that just makes me so happy. And also you get this big mansion that you get to decorate. And I think that satisfies my 
strange interior decorator needs where I can suddenly have a big swan pond, a gaggle of reporters outside, all these beautiful rose bushes. It's just amazing. Playing June's Journey has actually been a really nice mental health break for me. Sometimes it can kind of get stressful doing the podcast or, you know, just going day to day, waiting in line, waiting on a, a call where you've been put on hold. And it's fun to have something to do to kind of eat up that time and keep me mentally sharp while I'm sort of waiting around. I feel like I've gotten a lot more observational as the game is going along. I, I feel like sometimes I'm just like powering through these levels. It makes me really proud of myself. <laughs> and I think you guys would love it. I really think a lot of our listeners are people who would actually really enjoy this game and would find it really sort of soothing, but also fun. Give it a try. Tell us what you think. The Murder Sheet is an independent, smaller podcast. We don't have a huge staff. Sponsorships are really important to us. And anytime our listeners goes ahead and downloads something or, or purchases something from our sponsors, that's directly helping us. So if you can just go, and again, this game is free to download, download it, put it on your phone, play it a bit, let us know what you think, and certainly let June's Journey know that the murder sheet sent you. That's a huge boon to our show, and it helps us keep in business and keep doing what we love, which is reporting on different crimes and bringing you the best information. So with that in mind, find your first clue by downloading June's Journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games.